everybody. Like Patrice said, my name is Jake, and you know, I'm, I'm the student pastor, but what I'm most known for at East Lake Church is this. <laughs> she, she's my better half. I know that because you've told me that many, many times. This summer, we are diving deep into the power of prayer. And there's no better place to start than how Jesus taught us to pray all of those years ago. So with your outside voices, outside, online, inside, let's go ahead and read the Lord's Prayer together. It goes like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Today, we'll be focusing on seven words. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, when Jesus was referring to this, he obviously was talking about Michael Jordan's most famous shoe of all time, the bread. Or wait, maybe I got that the other way around. I'm excited because today we're actually looking, this is part of a year-long series, and we're looking at the ways of Jesus. We're looking at different commands that he's given us so that we might find a way to live ourselves. And today's command is to ask in faith. I'm about to give you the bottom line of the whole message, so if you just want to leave after this, you totally can. The shortest message of uh, East Lake Church's history. I'm kidding. But here's what the bottom line is of the whole message. When we ask in faith, it leads to God's help. Now, God has never promised to answer every prayer with a yes. Why? Because when we first pray the Lord's Prayer, we say, when your kingdom come. In other words, God, if this aligns with your kingdom, would you allow this to be true? And the second reason why not every prayer ends with a yes is because God has dedicated himself to loving his people. And love is always a choice. And humans sometimes make wrong decisions which lead to consequences. With that said, when he can, God loves to answer the prayers of his people with a yes. But we do know that God does answer every prayer with his faithfulness. But the question that I oftentimes ask is how do we pray? How do we pray to receive God's practical help? Because we all want this tangible help from God in our daily life where we feel the presence of God and we see how God is moving in our life. But that's difficult. I mean, we want this help because we have annoying coworkers that we don't want to hear talk at work. And you're like, God, please give me the patience. Maybe it's the traffic. Maybe it's something else entirely, like a difficult conversation or getting through the day because you're struggling with the grief and loss of someone close to you and you're praying for perseverance. But we all want that type of help. But how do we ask? I mean, is there a secret recipe that unlocks God? Does God actually care about the trivial daily things of my life or is that a little too small? Or... Can God actually change my circumstance? The problem oftentimes comes when we doubt that God can do this or we don't know how to ask. And when we don't know how to ask, we tend to answer our daily problems with our own answers. We tend to be the answer. And when that happens, that's a difficult place to be because we all know that it doesn't always work out when we're trying to be the answers to every problem. But Any product in the world will tell you that their product answers any problem that you have about that certain issue for the rest of your life. I mean, after reading a couple parenting books, you've you've finally found the key to to never regret anything in your parenting life. That doesn't really happen. Or maybe, maybe you you get the, the Peloton. And you're feeling pretty good about yourself. And they guarantee 12% body fat. That's the hack. For the rest of your life, you'll never have any shame about your body. Or maybe 
you downloaded the new productivity app, ChatGPT. <laughs> and ChatGPT allows you to, uh, you know, climb the ladder. And you're climbing the ladder, and then all of a sudden, purpose, money, they don't keep you up at night. We know these, are, these aren't really true, because at some point, the new app, the new book, that new hack, the new silver bullet, it'll ultimately come back void in the end. And we all know when we attempt to try to be the answers to every problem, at some point, we become helpless. And we're, we're, we're swimming, trying to swim above water with a mountain of debt, or trying to figure out what it looks like in our marriage when it's not going so well. And we wonder what help looks like. You can write this down. When we answer in doubt, it leads to our helplessness. But I'm convinced that when we ask in faith, we can go from feeling helpless by ourselves to being helped by God. I think there's something sacred in praying, give me today my daily bread. Do you know the, the Israelites who were listening to Jesus when he said this? They knew exactly what Jesus meant. They knew exactly what Jesus meant because it referred back to a story of their ancestors and how God saved their ancestors. So when they heard this prayer, it was powerful. And for us to, to unlock the key to this, this phrase, I think we need to go back to that origin story and see how the Israelites were saved by God and what that might mean for us today. So we're going all the way back to Exodus. Now, this is what happened, just to, to follow up before we jump into the story. The Israelites were, were trapped by the Pharaoh in Egypt. They were slaves, and through a series of miraculous come-from-behind stories, God used a man named Moses to let his people go. And then, they're in freedom. They're in a place called Elam, which was a place of rest, a place of comfort, then God called them to a place called Sinai and they had to travel for a couple of months and then they're in the desert. This is where the story picks up. A couple months in the desert. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if we only had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, there we sat around pots of meat, ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us out into the desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. People are to go out each day, gather enough for that day, and in this way I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. Have you ever noticed that listening is the first step in doing? Maybe you have a, a housemate or a child and you've asked them before you leave for work, hey, can you just take out the trash? Can you just pick up the room real quick? And then you come back home. Someone's already laughing because you already know what's going to happen. What? It's not done. And what's their excuse? Oh, that's what you meant. Oh, I, I didn't hear you. Listening is the first step in doing. This is how we know God listens to his people because he responded you know, we have no record of the Israelites at this time being starved. This is more the, the anxiety of having no food, more than the reality of having no food. I heard a definition of anxiety that I loved. It said, we underestimate ourselves in completion to the task, but we overestimate the task itself. We underestimate ourselves and we overestimate the task. Anxiety makes us do some pretty unhealthy things. I mean, notice how they celebrated leaving, being out of captivity from the Egyptians, and the celebrations were unheralded. Yet, a couple weeks later, they're complaining to God, like, our life was better as slaves. That's literally what they're saying to God. Our life was better then. After drinking an anxiety cocktail, they are all shook up. Yet God still hears their grumbling. If God listens to their complaining, how much more does he listen to your prayers? You can write this down. This is the first way that we can ask in faith so we can receive God's help. 
We ask raw prayers because God is a friend. It's interesting how we all have like prayer languages. You know, we all have kind of our different ways to pray. You know, and I kind of went back to the drawing board. I was like, if I can subdivide the ways we pray into like caricatures, uh, maybe that would be easier for us to kind of understand the different ways that we try to, we try to impress God with our prayers. Uh, this first one is called Steady Eddie. Bless this food in the hands that prepared it. Amen. Every time, their prayer never changes. No matter what family drama is happening, no matter the natural disaster outside of the doors, no matter the hunger pains at the dinner table, Lord, bless his food in the hands of prepared. Every time, it's the same prayer. Steady Eddie. If I just pray the same thing for decades, maybe like God will, God will, God will listen to me. Okay, this next one is called Memory Michaela. Lord, this is what they do. Lord, thank you for today. God, thank you that you sent your only begotten son, that whoever believeth in him shall never perish, but have eternal life. Like for some reason, they have to put a verse into every prayer. You know, I'm, this, is, this is a way that God knows that, you know, I listen to him. You know, I, 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 I memorize his verses, and I got to put it into every prayer. Uh, this next one is called Bougie Bob. Oh, wise all-knowing celestial being, would you grant me the wisdom to remember where I left my glasses? <laughs> it's, like a, it's like a prayer from a Shakespearean play, like God didn't graduate from the 1600s. This last one's my favorite. You can tell I got, you know, I got a little carried away with this, but, you know, just come along with me. This last one is called Humble Henry. Uh, Lord, thank you that I'm not like the guy next to me. That's my favorite. They have to prove every time in a prayer that, you know, they're, they're better than everyone else so that they deserve God's blessings. I swear, sometimes we look at prayer like the Heisman Trophy. This. At an arm's length distance, God withholds the blessing like the football until we figure out the perfect ingredient of how to ask. God is so holy, we feel like we need to have a holy language to him but somewhere down the line, we've been misled to believe that we have to change ourselves, change how we talk in order to receive the blessings of God. Let me be clear. God doesn't really care how you communicate the problem. He cares that you communicate the problem. Asking does not burden God. Asking blesses God. Asking unlocks God. And if we feel like we can't go to God with the actual tangible needs of our lives, it's gonna be very hard to build an authentic relationship. I mean, if someone in your life has passed away and you're mourning and you're going through it, you can tell God that you're angry at him. You can even swear at God. And you can do it because God cares more about you bringing to him the burdens of your life. So pray like you would if you're talking to a friend on a street corner. Pray like you would talking to a partner right before bread. Pr bed. Pray how you think. God is never disappointed by any prayer. He just delights in your intentionality for the relationship. I mean, wouldn't you want your kids to come to you with the burdens that they're carrying, the shame, and you don't care how they communicate it? I love this quote. This is by a man named Tyler Stanton, and it says this. When it comes to prayer... God isn't grading essays. He's talking to children. So if God can delight in prayers as dysfunctional as the ones wedged in the middle of the Bible, he can handle yours too without you cleaning them up first. If the Bible tells us anything about how to pray, it says God much prefers the rough draft full of rants and typos to the polished edited version. C.S. Lewis said of prayer, we must lay before him what is in us, not what ought to be in us. The way your motives change isn't by working them out in silence. It's through such brutal honesty with God that he, by prayer, can refine your motives. Complaints are welcome. Did you like how that was a quote within a quote? It's like a quote inception. 
All right, let's continue. This is maybe my favorite part of, of this story in Exodus 16. So God says, hey, I'm gonna bless you with manna. And it says, there's a, a, a layer of dew in the morning. Everyone was in their tents, right? Everyone's in their tents sleeping. They wake up, they're a little confused because after the dew leaves, there's the manna, thin kind of pieces of bread on the floor. They're, they first, oh, oh yeah, God said that he would, he would provide manna every morning. So the larger families go out and gather what they needed for the day. And the smaller families got what they needed, but the, what the Bible says is everyone had what they needed for that day. And now this next part um, is not technically in the Bible. This is how I think could have, what would have happened uh, if I was there, like what, 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 they were, what, what, what they were thinking, because it all didn't end happily ever after. Because God had one rule, just... Just one. Just don't keep it until the morning. And then, and then a couple of friends got together and they're like, oh, what, if we, what if we outsmarted God? I mean, God provided for today, but I don't know about you, but I don't know if he's going to provide for tomorrow. We have to figure this out. Okay, so <clears throat> here's what we're going to do. Everything. You bake it. Uh, you broil it, you boil it, you deep fry it, uh, you sear it, and I'll saute it. We're going to do everything. We're going to try every way to keep this bread so that by tomorrow we'll have enough, and then we don't really need this God guy. So they went back to their tents, and they went to bed feeling probably pretty good about themselves. And when they woke up, this is what the Bible says. So they paid no attention to Moses and kept part of it until morning. But when they woke up, it was full of maggots and began to spell. Now, after God proved his faithfulness to them, they still tried to take matters in their own hands. They still tried to be the answer to their prayers. This is the scarcity mindset. God will not provide, so I have to play both parts. I think a lot of us have a condition, I have enough but, I have enough, I have enough finance today, but if I just work another 10 hours a week, uh, I'll have more than enough finances tomorrow. I have enough influence today, but if I buy that new car, I'll have more influence tomorrow. If I have enough friends today, but if I say yes to every friend gathering, then I can multiply my friendships for tomorrow. I don't know if you've noticed this, but I've noticed when you try to overextend yourself, oftentimes that's at a detriment to the things that matter the most. You're out trying to gather all this bread. I got, I got to figure out how to saute it, sear it, grill it, bake it, broil it. And, and then your tent is suffering the whole time. Because we know that working 50 plus hours a week can sometimes, not always, but it can lead to a hard nuclear family dynamic. Uh, buying a new car that's extremely expensive can lead to a very hard financial season where everything is very, very tight or you go into debt that you don't want to go into. Saying yes to every friendship gathering can oftentimes lead to shallow relationships. When we try to, when we overextend, that oftentimes leads to controlling. And when we try to control, it often leads to us feeling helpless, like smelly bread full of maggots. Proverbs says, do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. Matthew says, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's troubles is enough for today. Joshua says, set yourself apart to the Lord. Tomorrow he'll do amazing things among you. So you're saying I should delete my retirement account? Maybe eat whatever I want, not work out? Well, not exactly. I mean, notice in the story that God didn't put the manna in their mouths they still had to wake up, get out of their tent, go and gather what they needed for the day and go back. Here's the difference. An abundance mindset says, I will do my part and God will do his. So there's two types of people. The one person that gathers what he needs but then overextends at the sacrifice of his tent and the one person who gets what he needs for the day goes back and sleeps. And do you know what happens when the person sleeps in the tent? What happens the next morning? In this story, there's more manna. 
God provides. So we can either work out of desperation or we can work in cooperation with God. It's up to us. So here's the second way. How do we ask in faith so we can receive God's help? Here's the second way. We ask concrete prayers because God is a provider. In just a couple of days, uh, for the first time in three years, we're taking hundreds of students, 40 leaders up. Um, we're going on a bus, then getting on a boat, and then arriving at Catalina Island for summer camp. And this is our first time at Catalina Island, and uh, there's a prayer that all of our leaders, and me, we've been praying for every day for months. The prayer is, God, would you, would you allow every student to commit or recommit their lives at camp this summer before the next school year. That's our prayer. It's a bold prayer, but we believe in a bold God. If we know God is a provider, we pray specific prayers, asking God to play his part. And I think so many of us are in the habit of praying generalized prayers. God, would you, would you have peace on earth? God, would you make everybody happy this year? And when we pray prayers so generalized, what we're saying to ourselves is God cares way more about the world. He doesn't really care that much about you. So we pray specific prayers because God is a specific God. Prayers like, God, would you provide me a place to rent under $2,500 this week? God, would you, would you give my wife the words that she needs to talk to her boss at 10 a.m. today? God, would you give my daughter the perseverance to continue regardless of what the tryout says? We pray these prayers because God actually cares for us. And these are scary. Like, you're actually now casting the things that you actually care about to God. And you're saying, God, have your way in this. But I'm asking if provision can look like this. This type of prayer. If it aligns with your kingdom, can provision look like this? That's a scary place to be. But imagine if you prayed concrete prayers every day, what kind of relationship could you form with this God? Well, you're risking it and God provides. And you're in this community with God and where it's a, he says something and then you say something and there's this relationship that leads to an active faith. So how does this end? I love this last scripture of Exodus 16. It says this. Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Take an omer of manna and keep it for generations to come. So they keep, so they can keep, so they can see the bread I gave you to eat in the wilderness when I brought you out of Egypt. So Moses said to Aaron, take a jar, put an omer of manna in it, then place it before the Lord to be kept for generations to come. The Israelites ate manna for 40 years until they came to the land that was settled. They ate manna for 40 years. 40 in the Bible represents a season of testing, of trial. Jesus was tempted by the devil in the desert for 40 days before he went and did his ministry. Moses, the first time, murdered somebody and felt so ashamed about it that he went into the desert for 40 years. The Israelites were in the desert for 40 years. Even the book Exodus that we're reading has 40 chapters. In all of these stories, God guided them out. What's the desert that you're going through right now? Is it an addiction, a relationship? You don't know a way out. Maybe it's your life. God always, always responds with a promise of deliverance. Either this life or the next. Did you know in the kingdom of God, there are no bad endings? What's broken can be restored, what's hurt can be healed, what's lost can be found, and what's dead can come back to life. God wants to help us out of the mud and the miry clay. That's who he is. So wherever you're at in your story, 
feeling that that part of your life is over, it's the last chapter, if God raised his own son from the dead, that probably means he can unend that chapter in your book. The same God who is in these stories that we find wedged in the middle of the Bible is the same God who is in your story right now. There is restoration and there is hope. God can literally unend a story. You can write down this. This is the third way. We ask and help, and this is how we can receive God's help. We ask in, in boldness. We ask bold prayers because God is a guide. If God is as big as we're talking about, he can probably handle your big prayers. How do you, how do you think God responds to your big prayers? Maybe you think of heaven like a, a big post office. And all, all your prayer requests get subdivided into different categories or themes. And then angels that kind of like act as elves receive your prayer requests. Thank you, John. Thank you, Frank. Thanks, Michaela. And they put it in each bin. But then, thanks, Kevin. Oh, this is a big one. And the elf angels run it up to the executive angels. Look at this. They're asking for healing for their marriage. What do we do with this? We got to give this to the big man. The executive angel runs it up to God, and God looks at it completely overwhelmed. He's like, this is above my pay grade. I feel like sometimes we, we look at asking bold prayers like this. I don't want to ask too much of God. I don't, I don't know how he's going to respond to that. But how did you respond the last time a close friend came to you with shame that they're carrying and they finally release it to you? Are you like, this is too much, I can't handle this? No. Oh, I, uh, you're annoying me. What we do immediately is, how can I help? How can I come alongside you? If this is true with a friend, how much more is this true with God himself when we ask big prayers? This is Ephesians 20. It says, God can do anything, you know, far more than you could ever imagine, guess, or request in your wildest dreams. What if you prayed like this was true? What kind of prayers would you pray? God, show me a different career path because this is not fulfilling me anymore. God, if, give me a way out because th this marriage right now is toxic and it's abusive. God, show me that there's life after this health diagnosis because I don't know if there is. In my attempt to move to San Diego when I was 20 years old, I did a new thing, asking for help. I did not do that. And I wrote a letter, a physical letter, and I sent it to a strange church called East Lake Church, 2,336 miles away. And in part, this letter said this. To be honest, this letter is difficult for me to write. I've never been good at asking for help. And if you ask my dad, he'll tell you that his son, Jake, he'll try to do everything by himself. My dad is right. But I've come to the conclusion that I have to let others help me. So this is me asking for help. And in order for this move to San Diego to happen, I need a job. I need a place to live. According to folklore, James receives this letter because it was addressed to James. And he's like, hey, if this guy has the boldness to write a letter, let's at least give him a call. And they give me a call. And then, of course, the rest is history. But I'm grateful that James picked up that letter all those years ago because I've had some of the best years of my life. I've found the love of my life here. I'm grateful James picked up that letter. Sometimes asking for help can lead you to places you never thought you'd go. How much more is this true with God? God has proven himself faithful through the millennia. God first had faith in us. So therefore, we have faith in him. He's proven that he's a friend when we're complaining He's a provider even when we're not listening. And he's a guide even when we don't know a way out. Knowing this, our prayers are raw. They're concrete. And they're bold. Just like when Jesus prayed thousands of years ago to the Israelites, 
God, give me today my daily bread. When problems arise, we don't answer in doubt. We ask in faith, and instead of feeling helpless, we begin to receive the help of God. I want to invite the band to come out. So what is a prayer that you don't want to pray? What's a prayer that's, that's scary? Yeah, that's the one. The one that you first thought of, that's probably it. The prayer is so raw, so concrete, that it, that it scares you. So bold. I don't know what that prayer is for you, but would you commit with me to pray that prayer during this next song? I don't know about you, but I'm tired of being the answer. I'm tired of getting myself out of a corner and then finding myself in another corner. I'm tired of holding all the weight on my shoulders. God is providing a different way. He's saying, you don't have to answer every problem by yourself anymore. That's why I'm here. Work in cooperation with me. We ask And we ask it in faith, God, would you provide? Would you do what only you can do in my life right now? And that opens up a future that is free from the shackles of desperation, that is free from the shackles of scarcity. We have faith that God holds the whole world in his hands. So we don't have to. My favorite line in this this song said, he's the God of our present. He's the God of the future. And he's the one who holds it all together. I've already challenged you a little bit. I'm just going to keep challenging you. Here's the next big challenge. When we get to those lyrics, and that'll be like three or four minutes into the song, this is probably after you've actually released that prayer to God about your marriage, release that prayer about your debt, release that prayer about addiction, that scary prayer that you refuse to pray, but now an annoying pastor is telling you to pray it. Yeah, that prayer, the first three or four minutes of the song, I hope that you pray that. And then when we enter this part of the song, God, you're the God of the present, you're the God of the future, and you're the one who holds it all together. When we get there, would you, would you do yourself a favor and release your hands like this to God? When we do that, we're praying, God, have your way. We're surrendering our lives. And that's risky. And you might be judged in this room, but we do it for ourselves so that we are reminded that we are not alone, that we have a God who fights for us for our tangible daily needs. God, give me today my daily bread. And it looks like this today. And I'm asking that your will be done, but I'm asking that your provision looks like a healed marriage. Your provision looks like debt that is finally resolved. Your provision looks like this. So we say when God is the God of our present, we lift up our hands both. I'm gonna ask you to do that during this song. God, thank you so much that you are the God of the now. You're the God of tomorrow. God, thank you that I don't have to be running out overextending myself for the sake of controlling. God, thank you that you're the answer. And I'm sorry it took me so long to realize that. So today, God, I stand here knowing you're the provider, not me. God, would you answer in boldness, God, would you answer the hundreds of prayers that we're going to release to you right now? God, would you answer them with a yes and amen?